And we are live. Welcome to Poets House live streaming from the great ether slash internet. My name is Paulo Javier, and I am a poet and program director of Poets House, a 30 plus year old literary nonprofit situated on Manhattan, Manahata in Lenape Haking, or Ehendawikitit, the traditional and ancestral land of the Canarsi, Kapsi, Huerpos, Simunoy, and Wekwaski collectively known today as the Ramapo, Nanticok, Lenny Lenape, and Delaware Lenape. I offer my respect to Lenape people and to their continuing presence in their homeland and throughout the diaspora, I offer my reverence. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in to today's program. I am so thrilled to be co-presenting uh, this program called Made in Harlem, which is part of an esteemed ongoing series presented by Will Cinema, and I'm excited to be welcoming Emily Apter, who is uh, one of the directors of Maisel Cinema, to this program today to tell us a little bit more about her organization. Hi, thanks, Paolo. I'm live streaming um, from my apartment in Brooklyn. Um, so yes, I just want to welcome everyone um, and say thank you so much to Latasha and Zora and Paolo and everyone at the um, Poets House team who is making this possible. I'm a cinema programmer at the Maisel's Documentary Center, which is a nonprofit cinema and education center in Harlem. We were founded by the documentary filmmaker Albert Maisel's in 2005. And you may know his work. He's most famous for making Grey Gardens and Salesman, Gimme Shelter. He and his brother David were known for pioneering a lot of the uh, direct cinema documentary techniques um, starting in the 60s. So our cinema is closed, of course, right now, but we have a lot of digital programming that you can find on our website. We are just beyond excited to be partnering with Poets House to present today Isaac Julian's Looking for Langston from 1989. Paolo mentioned that this program falls within a larger series that we've been working on at the Maisel's Documentary Center um, called Made in Harlem in honor of the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and the series looks at the sort of wide ranging lens of documentary film and the way that it's uh, captured and commemorated and explored the many layers of experience that make up and continue to make up the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and it brings together mostly non-fictional um, visual sources that um, together look at the long lasting influence of the Harlem Renaissance and um, uh, representations of political and artistic output, collective memory, present day black experiences in Harlem today. So this series would not be possible without support from the West Harlem Development Corporation. And yeah, I'm delighted to be looking at some of the literary legacies today via Isaac Julian and Langston Hughes and a much anticipated discussion between uh, Latasha, Zora and Paolo. Many, many thanks to Maisel Cinema for uh, really helping to uh, uh, co-present and to sponsor this program. I hope everyone gets a chance to uh, check out Maisel Cinema when we are all able and ready to do so uh, in uh, the great neighborhood of Harlem. Uh, so I am uh, equally pleased and honored to be welcoming our first presenter to uh, today's program, uh, Zora Said, who is a scholar, a fantastic poet, and a much respected editor. And uh, I don't really want to say anything more than that Zora published a really vital chapbook recently through CUNY's Lost and Found chapbook series on Langston Hughes, the journalist. Uh, and uh, I think um, that's a really good place to uh, end in my introduction and welcome Zora Said to Poets House Live. Uh, streaming from where, Zora? Hi, uh, thank you for that warm um, introduction. I'm calling in from um, Midwood in Brooklyn, and uh, a very busy, boisterous place still, um, safely boisterous. So, so I'm happy to join here. Um, I think that if we look at Hughes, um, if he hadn't faced so much racism um, after his return, and McCarthyism after his return from Central Asia, it would have been, uh, he would have produced an excellent a very thorough book on Central Asia. And the tragedy is that it had to be hidden away because of McCarthyism. What survives from the notes and what I was able to piece together um, is an ex 
is one of the best um, in-depth and sensitive readings that looks at um, relationships uh, during his trip rather than an emphasis on what's different than being American. So as an American writer, he was um, quite insightful, I would say. Uh, I'm gonna read it from uh, his own writings that were never published. Some he had turned into uh, South to Samarkand, which was published 20 years later with a lot more humor. Uh, he had published something in the Soviet Union called A Negro Looks at uh, Soviet Central Asia. And that um, uh, was um, um, is being annotated uh, by another scholar. So uh, I will begin uh, reading just his words. Samarkand. This is 1932, by the way. He left from uh, Harlem and he was um, in Moscow, part of a uh, film project that didn't uh, take off. And he uh, rec he advised, he actually, um, not revised, um, he actually proposed a trip to the south of the Soviet Union, which was uh, Central Asia or Turkestan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, this part of the world. And he was one of the first Americans translated into uh, Uzbek um, at the Schomburg is a wonderful uh, literary uh, contract, a publishing contract uh, written in Uzbek uh, that he still has, um, that he kept from his trips. All right. Samarkand, city of Tamerlane, the earth shaker. Before that, city of Genghis Khan, leader of the Mongols. And ere that, the sporting ground of Alexander the Great who murdered Clytus there 2,400 years ago when both were drunk with wine. This is from the introduction to South to Samarkand. Um, the readings here are actually from loose uh, notebook pages um, that were written on the train from Moscow uh, to uh, Ashgabat in Turkmenistan. September 24, 1932. About noon, we passed through Orenburg and then into Asia, saw camels pulling wagons. Sadiq Korbanov, the chairman of the city Soviet of Old Bukhara, came into our couch, coach and told us about his country, the rolling steppes. September 25, 1932. Today, we are really in Asia, yurts, Kazakhs, camels. We passed the north end of the Aral Sea at Kalyalinsk, in the late afternoon, we hold a Gorky meeting in honor of his 40 years as a writer. A Jewish Komsomol poet, a Russian train worker, and Uzbek and myself spoke here in the desert. I made a speech in English, which the Hollander who spoke Flemish translated into Russian, and the Russian then translated into Turkmen. I wonder what I said to have, <laughs> I wonder what I was said to have said by then. At any rate, the audience applauded when the paraphrase was over, and I was cheered as the first American to ever make a speech in Ashgabat. We see a lot of his humor and his poetry in his notebooks. Um, here's a poem that was handwritten. Um, I don't know, he never returned to this poem, but I thought it was quite beautiful. Sandstorm. When the wind walks across the desert and the sand rises to greet it, something in the wind wakes the sand to frenzy and they dance together, wind and sand, wind and sand, beneath the sun, whirling, moaning, laughing with gritty laughter, the wind and sand, forget about the camels and the caravans. I found that a poet keeping a, a journal uh, was still writing poetry and still writing stories throughout. So you see the musicality and these short haiku poems that seem to come through. Here's another one that was actually a cut out piece of paper um, all it says is, through the desert, under the blazing sky, eyebrows painted straight across the forehead in a single black line. Um, here's another observation in his notes, cut up papers as well. The uh, archive, uh, since we looked at, watched the film, um, archival photos are a big part of that collection. Uh, for Hughes, he kept every bit of minutia. So they were cut up papers, there were notebooks, um, there were typed notes, they were uh, snipped together and stapled together, but everything was kept. That's what makes the archive so rich. Here, here's his notes in Tashkent. 
Woman in streetcar with baby, conductor to woman. A nice fine baby like that. Why don't you keep his nose clean? Woman, tomorrow I'm going to the baths, conductor. You have to go to the baths to keep nose clean? General laughter in the car and scolding all visible children with unwiped noses. But the Uzbek woman rode on, her child's nose as it was before. The little bandit and his bird that he boiled and reboiled, slept in his clothes, wiped his nose on his towel, spoke Russian badly, and played well on their two-stringed, long-necked guitar. The sink always stopped up with cigarettes and tea, overshoes forever at the door. So it's hard to imagine these were unpublished. Um, there are other notes in his um, journal that are about connections. Uh, he saw there um, a connection between uh, Uzbeks who under the uh, czarist rule were separated. So uh, white czarists went into one area and Uzbeks and natives were in another area. It's the post-colonial or the colonial um, uh, segregation uh, that he saw. Um, so the connections that he was making with the poets were most important. This is why at the back of the um, photographs, the uh, small side marginal notes he kept, um, it expresses notes that uh, show a kind of friendship. Um, they all write something about his smile, about his friendship, about his warmth. And these traits are highly valued traits, hospitality, friendship, eating together, um, probably not something we're all worried about now, but eating together from one plate. Um, th these were all Central Asian customs that Hughes sits right along with uh, Uzbeks, Turkmen, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, and eats along with them. And that's one thing that broke a lot of the barriers so that he didn't write us and them, he wrote with the people. He wrote about relationships um, and the universal that he found, but also the specific historical details that other travelers uh, who went during that time period overlooked. Um, here's another note from his diary. At Metropole, Amur, uh, Amur Sanon, poet, Kalmuk region in Caspian. Dolgan, director of Auto Trust. He says, we are dark people too. That's another one about connections. Uh, what he did was also, uh, he translated very rare texts um, in his lifetime. He worked not only to uh, write poetry, um, as songs and um, stories, but uh, he really developed a lot of friendships. And this is not just uh, Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan, but uh, he was quite worldly and cosmopolitan. Um, so the poem that he translated here, it looks like it was um, one of the poems that were uh, most likely banned as uh, ethnic uh, chauvinist texts that uh, Soviet era writers unions did not um, allow to be printed. So uh, this is called Old Uzbek Poem in his notes, uh, not only as he translated, but he notes the uh, female translator who was apparently um, talking to him with her child in her lap uh, as, um, uh, as they were breaking down this poem. So this is old Uzbek poem from Hughes. Um, I told her charming, you must wear on the sugar of your wrists, the circles of golden bracelets for ornaments are adornments good for a beauty. And she answered me with sweet coquetry I am afraid the web of my hands cannot stand the weight of gold. And I told her, Enchantress, in the deep forest of your hair, you must put ribbons of pearls, and the shining of your hair will rival the glitter of the pearls. And she answered, I am afraid that the tender reed of my body will be bent beneath the weight of pearls. I told her, Magician, you must cover the flowers of your body with cashmere sink, skip silk, and then your beauty will be as fresh as the roses in the sunrise. And she answered, I am afraid that the silk will spoil the petals of my flower-like body. So here the beloved uh, and the lover have a uh, interaction, but the beloved is um, boasting about herself. It's a very old medieval type of poetry and he um, brought this back in the notebook. So he did not publish this. He published um, a translation that he worked on with, um, Nina Zarakovitz, uh, he worked with her on several translations of poetry from the Russian. Rafa Ghulam is a communist uh, Uzbek poet 
and uh, his work was uh, not translated into English. He had published it in a leftist uh, journal when he came back, um, just to show you the difference in the different styles of poetry. And he was collecting and being aware of colonial era, medieval era, which is the glory days of, of Central Asia, and then communist era, um, social equality um, and social activist type of poetry. So this is from Ghafur Ghulam, his translation. I'll just read a few lines. Along these roads, very ancient, across these steppes and mountains and valleys, went slaves and widows, their necks in iron chains, five, ten hundreds of millions of men, condemned, weakened, hunted by sorrow, and they came again to sorrow. So this fits much more the aesthetics of um, Soviet Uzbek poetry at the time. Um, again, just to show you the way Hughes works in collecting his uh, worked in collecting his notes. Um, he didn't have one angle and he wasn't pushing the Soviet agenda that um, the authorities were hoping that that he would push. So when they brought um, when the Soviet Union brought uh, African American writers, actors, and activists to Moscow, uh, they had hoped they would find a kind of um, um, an, a propaganda voice uh, among among the writers. So Hughes uh, is quite interesting because he supports the equality and he, he definitely uh, s supports the uh, communist ideals. But what he does is that he uh, subverts the authority. Um, so when he's given a scheduled uh, trip through Central Asia, he jumps off the train and then he goes off on his own adventure and he communicates using what he says, uh, hand gestures and a little bit of French and he was able to get through in um, Ashgabat, Turkmenistan. Uh, there he met Arthur Kessler, uh, he was playing jazz. Arthur Kessler came to him in the hotel. They traveled together with the Turkmen poet, uh, Shali Kekalov, who would translate into Russian for Kessler. Kessler would translate into English. So it would be Turkmen to Russian to English. Uh, with Nina Zarkovsky, Zarkovitz, it was, uh, Russian to French to English. So the uh, translations were quite fun and the selection I read was also about misunderstandings. Um, what I wanna end off with is probably one of the most um, important finds for me as a um, Uzbek Afghan American who has a, um, my history comes from, uh, or my family mythology or migration starts from about 1920s and 30s in Uzbekistan. And um, it's what allowed me to read the text, the material, the poetry that was left for Hughes uh, was written in uh, old Chagatai Uzbek. It was written in old Uzbek. Uh, there was a translation of this poem uh, by Karim Ahmadi, one of the poets he had met in Tashkent, 1933. Um, in the uh, Bainaki archives, there are a lot of photos of Karim Ahmadi, although in the published writings, there isn't really a reference to him. And the reference to the Turkmen poet Shali Kekalov was um, as Charlie. So we miss a lot of the names. Um, it was important for me to find that relationship and finding this poem, not that it was disorganized, the archives are always organized, but finding in the sense that Karim Ahmadi had been filed under Karen Akhmadi. And um, this whole search has been through adventures and dreams and, and family mythology and ghost stories. So. Uh, I found the nine pages of the poem um, written in old Uzbek translated very differently than what we read. So I worked with my father to translate. And the poem is called um, For Langston Hughes on His Arrival to Uzbekistan. So uh, let me read the, the version that um, the version that my father and I translated from uh, the poem in 1932, written in 1933. Poems for Langston Hughes on his arrival to Uzbekistan. Crossing many oceans you've come, leaving your family behind. I saw you and felt wrapped in the curls of your hair. The black and white of you, a protective eye talisman, entered my poor home. When I look in your beautiful eyes, I loved you. In front of your glowing face, your words came like stars. And now you must hold my words. I am powerless in the face of the Komsomol. I am hiding. You are a sacred race. Low is anyone who calls, uh, calls them barbarians. Our tongues are folded away. We have many novels, poems that are woven in tears. 
Um, he was given a translation of this poem. Uh, I don't know if it was in his handwriting or someone else's, but it was a one page translation that was absolutely the opposite of everything that was written in that poem. Uh, so this is the translation that was in the archives. Uh, Listen to me, dear Langston, to LH on his arrival in Uzbekistan. I greet your arrival, the hero man. Hey, you who came across the ocean, the lion who conquered the waves of the sea. I am bound to you as tightly as the curls of your hair. And when I saw your eyes, I loved you. Welcome you, the poor son of the West. When my eyes look into your lively laughing eyes, I see the suppression of your people. But when I see your smiling face, I raise my fist against the West. Why? Because in your face, there are the winds of cold, bitter days. Their aim is to take you by the throat, to oppress you, the devils. So that translation takes away a lot of the, um, again, medieval um, uh, romanticized language in the actual poem. Um, I think there's a very big difference between I saw you and felt wrapped in the curls of your hair to I am bound to you as tightly as the curls of your hair. Maybe a slight difference. Feels a little more romantic in the other one. Um, so uh, this poem is um, separated from this great photo of Hughes in a hat um, with the Uzbek poet uh, Karim Ahmadi, who's wearing an Uzbek traditional chapan, big wheelbarrow uh, behind them, and um, you know, just sort of posing in the middle of winter in Tashkent. Um, I want to end on that poem because. Um, uh, for me, uh, he, the way Hughes saw Central Asia um, uh, and how he interacted and the friendships is something I wanted to bring back uh, to the U.S. And then back to Central Asia, I wanted to return the work that Hughes records in his uh, diaries and journals of African Americans who built the cotton industry in uh, Uzbekistan. So these two uh, conversations, uh, I think, need to happen. And so those are Hughes's worldly adventures in Central Asia. Thank you so much, Zora. Uh, as ever, I am inspired with a million questions after a presentation, but we'll get to hopefully at least a fraction of them, those million questions, uh, after Latasha's presentation. Welcome, a terrific poet, a trailblazer for me. Uh, I used to watch uh, this next poet perform in um, the West Village. To call uh, this poet merely a poet without the capital P, or actually all caps, would be a disservice to Latasha Diggs's range as a poet, performer, editor, galvanizer, and just a pioneer in all of these arts that she excels in. And also a, a longtime resident of Harlem. I am so excited and thrilled and honored to welcome Latasha Diggs to our program today. Howdy. Latasha, how are you doing? I'm doing good, <laughs> considering I'm alive. First, I wanna thank uh, Paolo and Poets House, as well as uh, Maisels for putting this event together. Um, it's a lot of thoughts come to mind, but I, I won't babble that much. I do want to uh, give a quick nod back to Zora Saeed. Um, one thing that is particularly special um, about the project that she did was that these archives, the, these, these notes and uh, photographs and uh, pieces of paper, paper clipped, were in the archives and no one knew about them. They were in a file and it was Zora who actually uh, introduced all of us, shall we say, to um, Langston's journeys and his experiences with people of Central Asia. So I wanna give her a nod quickly. Uh, so what I'm going to do is a, a little scramble of sorts. Last night, I was digging through the piles of books um, because I wanted to 
read from, I believe his last book that was published in uh, July 17th, 1967. And this is some months after his death, which was May 22nd, 1967, uh, The Panther and the Lash. I wanted to read some of the poems because according to my memory, I think this might've been the first Langston Hughes book I read. Um, I came to Langston Hughes late. <laughs> despite the fact that I'm someone who's born and raised in Harlem. Um, and I think I might've heard the Weary Blues, but it was really this book that uh, became my introduction. So I'm gonna read a couple of the poems. I find this book special because while there's work that ranges from the 1930s up until his death, it also includes uh, longer poems by Langston, as well as poems that where he's responding to events that are taking place on the African continent. So while they explore Harlem, they're also exploring the South, but also exploring Patrice Lumumba, Angola, Johannesburg, and so on. So let me let me get into reading some. Harlem. Here on the edge of hell stands Harlem. Remembering the old lies, the old kicks in the back, the old be patient they told us before. Sure, we remember. Now when the man at the corner store says sugar's gone up another two cents and bread one, and there's a new tax on cigarettes, we remember the job we never had, never could get, and can't have now because we're colored. So we stand here on the edge of hell in Harlem and look out on the world and wonder, what we're going to do in the face of what we remember. Motto. I play it cool and dig all jive. That's the reason I stay alive. My motto as I live and learn is dig and be dug in return. Death in Yorkville. How many buzzet bullets does it take to kill a 15 year old child? How many bullets does it take to kill me? How many centuries does it take to bind my mind, chain my feet, rope my neck, lynch me unfree? From the slave chain to the lynch rope to the bullets of Yorkville, Jamestown, 1619 to 1963, emancipation centennial, 100 years not free. Civil War centennial, 1965. How many centennials does it take to kill me? Stay alive. When the long hot summers come, death ain't no jive. Ghosts of 1619. Ghosts of all too solid flesh, dark ghosts come back to haunt you now. These dark ghosts to haunt you, yet ghosts so solid, ghosts so real, they may not only haunt you, but rape, rob, still, sit in, stand in, stall in, vote in, even vote for real in Alabama, and voting not give a damn for the fact that white was right until last night. Last night, what happened then? Flesh and blood ghosts become flesh and blood men. Get tired of asking when? Although minority suddenly 
became majority, metaphysically speaking, is seeking authority? How can one man be 10, or 10 be 110, or 1,010, or a million in 10, or but 1,010, or 110, or 10, or one, or none, being ghost of then? Dinner guest, me. I know I am the nigger of problem, being wined and dined, answering the usual questions that came to white mind, which seeks demurely to probe in polite way the why and wherewithal of darkness USA. Wondering how things get this way in curate democratic night, murmuring gently over foies de bois, I'm so ashamed of being white. The lobster is delicious. The wine divine and center of attention at the damas table mine. To be a problem on Park Avenue at eight is not so bad. Solutions to the problem, of course, wait. In the last one from The Panther and the Lash, little song on housing. Here I come, been saving all my life to get a nice home for me and my wife. White folks flee as soon as you see my problems in me. Neighborhoods clean, but the house is old. Prices are doubled. When I get sold, still I buy. White folks fly. Soon as you spy, my wife and I. And um, only because Paulo asked me to, um, I'm gonna read just two poems. Um, that are from an ongoing um, body of work with no title yet. Jesus, children of America. Hear mama muddle moan, her spirit a high sour mourn. From covers moving, words muffled, move parallel. Can't stand for nothing cause mama can't stand upright medicated on fortified. View mama case record a feet high from a record crate. No rose sweeter save maybe those dried in Bibles. Self-taught hand-sewn hymns high water, transfer in marrow narrow men. Wax thee, whip her and me holy. Care saves no one near a pint of chilled transcendental. Common sense in common areas. See mama overrun, raggedy redeemer, mourn markings, hook scars on skull, vicious vex seedy arenas. Mama drown in high gutter, raw murmur. Only boy still born, now mama ration muscatow, misery loves company. Mania a mascot. Seven Marys in the tree, ain't one was mama to mama. Rack at this mildewed memoir. That black mold will get you. Holy roller soliciting for a muse. Rescue me, rescue my mold mama. I come from nervous noir. And the last poem. Son of a Negro explorer, not at the North Pole. Hawk the rabbit trim, darling. The iconographic halo shadows your stare. Whose barber makes the grooming regal? What do you point towards? Silver leaf children pray to your Nikes, tangerine and blood and Japan leather. Can you see father? Hold the pose, Henson's legacy. 
decadent of Inuit, cloud bursts of wonderful sexy. His is your bequest, seamen and Arctic booty. Clock wolves, rock the navigator, hand over your barbecue whale meat, polar bear and little Louis French kiss. Mirror, mirror at the ball, warris blubber carved with your sword. Familiar, foreign. Lime cargoes reflect the cold tundra sun. Your name, a new cock of the polar grounds. Where's your father? Perk contests the dog sled as prop. Chiseled Arabian, your palate companion. Bitch, walk. Thank you. Thank you, Latasha. Wow. Um, what we're gonna do next is, well, I certainly wanna talk about your new work, but what we're gonna do right now is we're going to show a trailer of, uh, Isaac Julian's Looking for Langston. And then I'm gonna welcome both Zora Saeed and Latasha Diggs back for uh, a much anticipated conversation about all of these. So here's a trailer of uh, Isaac Julian's uh, groundbreaking and remarkable documentary. And that was a trailer from Isaac Julian's 1989 uh, documentary, Fantasia, uh, Cine Essay, tribute to uh, Langston Hughes and uh, his um, remarkable community and his poetry, certainly. Uh, welcome back, Zora Saeed and Latasha Diggs. Um, I gotta say, I, I've, I've seen this documentary multiple times and I rewatched it last night and I have not, changed in terms of my gut response to it, which is, it is still sexy. <laughs> it is still beautiful. But what has added to my appreciation of it is, um, I guess the, the, the political, the political intentions of both Isaac Julian, and I guess just um, the, the moment that we're in, where the gaze that is that went into the making of this film and the uh, gaze that runs throughout this film, so groundbreaking for its time, but to actually see it today, it I feel it in so many different ways and new ways um, that I thought might be a good place for us to start. Given uh, Zora, you were talking about how Langston would look at and write about, write with the people he was encountering in his travels, right? And uh, Latasha, you're reading poems of Langston's and uh, one of the things that both initially stopped me from really appreciating Langston Hughes when I first encountered his work in middle school and grew to appreciate later on was what was not on the page that was making him write these poems in terms of performativity that Isaac Julian's documentary brings home in terms of the footage of Langston playing in front of a band and just how truly uh, visionary and interdisciplinary Langston Hughes was. So let's start there maybe with the gaze and I'm happy to follow you where you lead us. Uh, oh boy, I will, I think one of the, uh, well, 
One was that I had not seen this film in a very, very long time. And so watching it um, in preparation for this conversation, I was reintroducing myself to the filmmakers, meditation, elegy, uh, I want to say lullaby, but uh, a, a a sort of a song, shall we say, um, to um, not just Langston, but you know, also the other writers that are um, invoked in in this in this piece. And so, watching it, I was it it, it I didn't remember how little. Um, Langston is actually, Langston's work is actually in the film, um, which I didn't remember. And I had to ask myself why, why was that the case, you know, beyond, you know, copyright things. And did it need to be, or was this Isaac's choice to not to kind of, uh, gesture towards what Langston may have not been able to do when he was alive or what he chose to be more important um, as his public persona and how he would support other writers and the black experience and the global experience minus uh, the gay experience. Um, so it made me think a lot about that. Um, but it also made me think about, um, if I wrote, what did I write down here? How much pressure he was under um, um, as, as someone who was very public, but at the same time uh, private. What what would Langston have written about um, just a couple of years later had he survived? Um, and I'll pass it on to Zora. This is the first time I'm I'm watching it. Uh, I thought that um, um, what Latasha said is really uh, powerful. There is something in um, Harlem Renaissance. Uh, poetry that both takes, and there's a line of this in uh, the archival footage used and in um, a conversation on, or a visual conversation, I would say, on Harlem Renaissance poets and what and artists and sculptors, because you see the actual footage that people did not see. And one of the things with uh, the Julian documentary that was, um, and, and uh, for me, I took documentary very literally, but um, this film was definitely a very poetic take on this and uh, has a dreamlike quality to it. But that moving between, uh, that sort of interweaving of uh, archival footage, seeing Hughes looking at art, seeing Hughes uh, reading poetry, like Latasha said, and um, or as Paula said, uh, in front of a, a band. I mean, all of these things bring him to life, but then the stories and the relationships and the intimacies and the worlds that he may have not expressed. I know that uh, not many people were supporters of the film or the supporters of the read of the way uh, um, Isaac Julian had originally read it. But um, it's such a, a beautiful poetic homage to him that it's hard to believe that um, people uh, could find this controversial. Um, I would say something else that really struck me that just to continue on with Hughes and what he was doing with uh, his poetry. I'm always uh, wondering why Hughes was never included as a modernist poet, um, because he rejected this push for Harlem Renaissance poets and artists to um, create primitivist type of uh, primitivism and to go into sort of African, the essence of what it meant to be African, uh, which is what he was getting funding for uh, early on. And he breaks that relationship uh, especially in the 1930s when he um, goes off on his, this Moscow journey. Um, 
he breaks a relationship with his sort of mentor and sort of um, benefactor because he does not want to produce this. He wants to take the primitive, like modernist uh, artists and writers and construct it into his own narrative, into his own story. And I think that contrast cost him, um, he did stand up a lot for himself um, uh, early on as well. Um, the film, I think the other thing that really struck out for me in the film was, um, um, I felt like the music also said a lot. There's a soundscape that felt like the pauses in between the journal readings and the time in the library looking at his handwriting and uh, these short interactions that he was able to catch. So um, that's definitely not an intellectual analysis. So I hope uh, um, you'll forgive me for that, but as a feeling, it, it definitely um, strike, struck me as, as quite true to the pauses in, in Hughes's writing between thoughts, I thought. Yeah, I, I must say that when I had first seen, I'd seen the documentary on PBS and I was anticipating to find and to see Langston Hughes in, I guess, the more conventional uh, sense of documentary narratives. And when I wasn't going to actually see that documentary, it actually made it more meaningful. It stayed with me, haunt. it was more haunting for me, but it was also powerful and uplifting because to see that the gaze, in hindsight, I realized Isaac Julian's gaze, right? Uh, and I think maybe you can correct me on this, Zora, because you know more about Langston Hughes's biography than I do, but he had a, one of his partners whom he named Beauty, which I think Julian's film alludes to, to have, you know, at, whether it's Fantasia, whether it's fictional, you know, auto fiction, to have Langston Hughes, the character, the object of desire, right, be someone else who's black or who's brown and for the same standards of beauty that Robert Mapplethorpe problematically applied to the black male figure in the 80s and this documentary was made in 1989 to actually have Isaac Julian make that gaze his own but then also yeah. have the structuralist critique of how is Langston Hughes framed for me in hindsight I see that now right you know perhaps we're still looking for Langston you know, I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, that leads me to my next question. How did you get involved in this archival work with Langston Hughes? That, um, I actually saw it online. Um, there was a photo of Hughes and uh, uh, other Central Asian writers. And the write-up had said, um, here's Langston Hughes. Here's one other identified poet. And uh, everyone else was probably killed in this photo. And I thought there has to be more to the story than just that everyone died and that was it. I mean, so I went thinking that there was a complete um, document. This is while I was a PhD student. My work was on Afghan American women's video art. But then when I found this, um, when I found this, it just intrigued me and I left it to, uh, I left that work to go to the Yale Library and um, I called up the wrong numbers. I thought there was a complete work called From Harlem to Samarkand, uh, which what I thought was in the reading, it was in um, um, so Central Asian uh, Studies uh, magazine type. I forgot what it was called. Um, so I called up the wrong file and I ended up finding his notebooks that said from Russia to China. And what um, I thought it would just be Russia and then jumps to China, but it was actually just about Central Asia and that the way it was filed in the 1950s, um, there wasn't a specification, like anything written with Arabic alphabets was filed as Arabic, um, nothing Persian or Turkic uh, was sort of read. Um, everything that looked like an Asian face was filed as China. So uh, there was a missing um, connection between these notebooks and the photos that were there. Um, so I, I, um, no one had really looked through it from what it looked like. It was all put to, the binding was pretty clean on the notebooks. I transcribed the notebooks um, and then I footnoted the, the, the notebooks because I could see that he was building a history. And then I went to the Schomburg thinking there was something else. I got a fellowship there as well. Uh, the lost and found people at Bar at um, um, CUNY Grad Center. Uh, Emil Alcalay is my mentor. So he was very excited. I thought, 
that it would be like, hey, let's look at this cool thing. And I would have left it behind, but he encouraged me to pursue it. And it's because of him, I was able to find a missing or sort of a sealed envelope at the Schomburg Library, which had all of the key names and writings and published material of the Central Asian poets that he was photographed with. So it turned out that many were um, still alive or alive um, enough to be uh, prominent and uh, important Central Asian poets. And it's the note keeping of Hughes, it's the relationships, it's the poems they wrote back and forth, marginal notes, what he came back with, what he had hoped to create with the notes that he had that really inspired me to do the detective work and piece together these two archives. So that's three years of work and ongoing. <laughs> and it makes me think about, you know, who else we're not looking at closely in terms of, right, to get a fuller picture of the cultural experience and interest and vision, right, uh, of members of the Harlem Renaissance. I imagine that with this documentary of Julian's uh, was partially made in homage to James Baldwin, who I think had pa passed two years before it was, it was mm -hmm. produced, but also, in 1989, we're talking about right the AIDS epidemic, right ravaging uh, black and brown communities. But really, black and brown communities were not front and center in terms of who was being deeply affected by this. And the documentary has really remarkable poets like Essex Hemphill, who was also was a spoken word pioneer based in D.C. Um, and you also have Stuart Hall, who uh, writes about Fanon and he's a cultural critic. Mm -hmm. And you have him in there reading and it's an international, it's an international reach that the documentary is trying to make, which actually is something that I'm very curious of in our appraisal of the Harlem Renaissance, the beats, modernism that include non-European writers, right? Negritude and to really map those out. And Latasha, you're, uh, you have a very similar internationalist vision. You travel, um, your work spans languages, uh, your travel span continents. Um, what, wa what was your response to how both Julian's documentary um, considers Langston Hughes or looks for Langston Hughes and vis-a-vis, -vis, I guess, Zora Said's findings of Langston, you know, because it seems like in the documentary, Langston remains elusive, but that seems to be purposeful. But then in Zora's, we have this incredible discovery being made. And for you as someone who comes out of multiple traditions, but I think to be an amazing experimental poet, how did you, you know, appreciate both of these? It 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 made me think of uh, Langston's other counters with writers um, from literally all over the world, um, and to hone it down to Harlem, uh, his interactions with um, Afro Latino writers, uh, writers from the Caribbean writers from the African continent, as well as writers from uh, Asia. Uh, it also immediately made me think of John Keane's uh, collection of short stories and novellas uh, entitled Counter Narratives, in which uh, John writes uh, this very short story about an encounter between Langston and a Mexican writer. Um, and that's all I'll give you <laughs> for right now <laughs> regarding that story. But it, 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 it made me think of how writers now are really trying to, uh, under a microscope, see the many different sides of Langston and Hughes beyond um, the poems that we are so familiar with since preschool. And uh, with Zora's work, that to me was just 
proof that um, beyond um, what we may or may not know about uh, Langston's personal life, he was someone who was really in communication with a lot of people um, and wanted to be. Yeah, and I think what I what I also got from Lucien's documentary, I mean, it was it was somewhat fleeting because there were multiple voices throughout the documentary, multiple gazes in the narrative. But there was a mention of a critique of Hughes's white patron, right? And white patronage mm -hmm. in general. And uh, the way that the Harlem Renaissance has been framed for me as a emerging poet, right? I always felt there was something missing to it, right? Uh, and well, I think as I've gotten older, it really is just the internationalist vision of all artists and you know great artists in general and why this, why in the framing of the Harlem Renaissance as they teach it to you, in my experience, right? Has it been so, you know, narrow, right? And it makes me think mm -hmm. about the recent controversy with the New York Times and Roberta Smith and her talking about how, Black art has landed, has finally arrived. And you have Langston Hughes back then saying, no, this is not, this is not what the Harlem Renaissance can and will only be about. And, um, mm -hmm. The autonomy and agency that Langston Hughes both fought for and got to enjoy, right? So Zora, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, when Langston was traveling, um, what were his experiences like as an American. I, I want to say one thing about Harlem being an international uh, place and that the Harlem Renaissance is um, packaged in a way that makes it, um, I don't know if I should say diluted, but there is a packaging that's very different than the time itself, the movement that was happening before it had the name Harlem Renaissance, right? The struggles and, and the concepts they were uh, working and molding and breaking through. So um, I want to say also that Harlem in the 1930s was very much um, a place where it launched people into these international trips, whether it's Central Asia, Asia, Moscow, um, Cuba, uh, all these places that uh, African-American writers had been traveling to. To Central Asia, Paul Robeson had gone earlier and he uh, received even a, a Stalin medal um, later on, but uh, he was most popular um, so it's uh, Waylon Rudd's, um, Claude McKay didn't go there, but W.E.B. Du Bois had gone uh, to a conference in uh, Central Asia, uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Uh, there were a lot of Afro-Asian writers coming together and working and uh, uh, traveling or having conferences. The Afro-Asia uh, Bandun Conference was one. Um, but Hughes is one of the earliest and the first um, black American to enter uh, Central Asia. There was only maybe two or three, maybe two um, Americans who went as um, um, diplomats in the 19th century, but Hughes is really the first poet to be translated into um, Uzbek. Uh, his Weary Blues is translated. The Schomburg has this great gift of a contract that was written in Uzbek, um, and in it he's given, he said he's paid more and he can live on um, what he makes as a writer uh, in Central Asia. Now, um, the other thing about um, Hughes's trip is that he proposed the trip. They were not for uh, sending people over because they were still counter-revolutionaries, which would be my ancestors, uh, counter-revolutionaries in Central Asia. And they were not sure if it was fully under control enough to send Americans there. But because he insisted, and he was very persuasive uh, and charming, um, everyone writes about how charming Langston Hughes is, uh, they let him go, and again, like I said, he he jumped off and went on his own journey. Now, um, he taught writing workshops uh, there to factory workers, to people he met along the way. He was also not the first um, African American there, besides performers. Uh, there were cotton engineers and architects and road builders. Um, I guess I'd be an engineer, because humanities person didn't know that. Uh, engineers from and agriculturalists from Tuskegee and from Virginia Tech who could not get jobs here um, because of racism went to Uzbekistan and built a little tiny place in rural Uzbekistan where by the time Hughes got there in December 1932 they were able to have a Christmas dinner 
with pumpkin pie and, you know, turkey, maybe it was lamb, but they got turkey. Um, and had this uh, tiny little American experience and culture sort of in rural Uzbekistan. So although he was not always about finding comfort and finding um, uh, people like him when he travels. So that's what makes him very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna add to um, Zora because she brought it up. Richard Wright actually wrote an account of the Bangdong Conference of 1955 um, called The Color Curtain. And so highly recommend it as a document of that time of um, particularly Black Americans traveling overseas. Well, you know, we are sadly out of time. And as ever, we are only uh, scratching the surface with the tip of the iceberg of our conversation. I do just want to plug this one, this photo of Helen Johnson, who's a CUNY uh, lost and found uh, book, um, continues to be a, a delight for me and a real inspiration. and. Uh, Helen Johnson is one of, I think, many other Harlem Renaissance writers who we could have devoted this program to. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, thank both Zora Saeed and Latasha Diggs. Uh, Zora, you're in Midwood, and Latasha, you're in Harlem. Uh, thank you both so I'm much for being a part of this program. Um, it's also I th it's Earth Day, and I want everybody to you know, continue their fight for the Earth and touch the Earth if you can with gloves on if you feel inclined. Uh, and uh, be safe. Uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing you both again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And that's uh, tonight's program. Uh, my thanks again to our guests, Zora Saeed and Latasha Diggs. Uh, I am Paolo Vier, a poet and program director of Poets House. Uh, be safe, be kind to one another. Uh, let's celebrate and let's continue to honor and fight for our earth. Take care, everybody.